Thank you and good morning. Um, congratulations to the center. Always a pleasure to be here, especially at this uh, occasion, of course. Um, today, European leaders are meeting, uh, met, because the day has finished <laughs> in, in Europe almost, uh, in Sweden, to talk about a more social Europe, inequality raised in Europe, as Christine just mentioned. The EU is aiming for serious reform, reconstruction, um, but will there be support from the member states for that? Across Europe, um, populist parties, it has already been said, represent between 20 and 30 percent of the, pop of the electorate at both sides of the uh, political spectrum. And all these parties are Eurosceptic, at least, and mostly anti-Europe. Populism, anti-cosmopolitanism, um, is not new in Europe. Um, we can refer to the to our history in the 20th century, we can go further back. The recent movement started already in the 1980s, for instance in France and the Netherlands, and these two countries said in 2005, in referenda, no to the European Constitution. Um, also in higher education, there was a no. These are the students that rallied in the streets in the south against the Bologna process in the early 2000s. Students also protested during a conference in 2006 in Athens of the OECD where scenarios on the future of higher education were discussed. The protests were so violent that the entire conference had to be evacuated to a nearby peninsula, peninsula to ensure the safety of the higher education ministers. The ideas that were discussed, I, I attended that conference, everybody agreed that it would be a more international future for higher education. The scenario that was not discussed, neglected really in the discussion, not seen as relevant at that point, I think, was serving local communities. It was described by the OECD as follows. And this is precisely what happened. I think, and I'm also going to quote myself, because I also looked 10 years back, and I wrote, and I think it really was clear then that we didn't look, need to look into the future to see that a rebalancing of globalization was needed and that this would have consequences for higher education institutions. <coughs> that they had to think about their social contract in a global context. And that they had to be more inclusive in their internationalization and to really embrace diversity. I continued that argument, and also UNESCO made the point in 2015 on the social contract in the global context. I continued to play for inclusive internationalization to educate real global citizens. But this is what world, some world leaders now have to say about global citizenship. So the real shock came in 2016, after Turkey, Hungary, Brexit, the election of Trump. And I think this quote captures very well the feeling among international educators in Europe. And in the next AIE conference that I attended in 2017, just this September, we were trying to come to grips with the anti-globalization, but also anti-internationalization. The conversation is taking off on that we need to rethink internationalization to make it more inclusive. 
A note on the Netherlands. The protest against organ, uh, internationalization is also heard in my country. There's a big discussion going on on teaching in English versus teaching in Dutch. There is a discussion and questions in different cities and in the national parliament about international students taking the place of domestic students in the university and in the dorms. It's not mainstream, but there's quite some discussion also, in particular in the University of Amsterdam. It's not just from outsiders. Student fraternities, student organizations that have that run um, student houses on the basis of co-optation regularly have as a first criterion no foreigners. There was a proposal adopted in our parliament to scrutinize universities for political correctness. The Royal Academy took it up um, after it had been adopted by parliament to see whether political diversity is ensured in universities. The critique on internationalization is not uniquely European. Is also voiced in the US. Here also, the plea to be more inclusive, more diverse, and especially less elitist. I think this all creates a lot of pressure on higher education institutions. They're globally engaged, but nationally embedded. It has been mentioned before. Governments at the same time want their universities to shine in the global sphere, but to deliver on national goals. Accountability happens in national frameworks. All globalization is local, said John Douglas. So here's the critique, especially on universities that are very engaged globally and very um, focused on their global positioning, like on rankings, a world-class university movement is criticized for jeopardizing their national mission, for creating divides, or for becoming footloose from society as an academic jet set of cosmopolitan types who live in their own world. This is one of my colleagues in Utrecht University. And most certainly, the strategic management of these universities is becoming far more complex than it has been before. Let's go to back to Europe and Brexit. I'm involved in a research project on Brexit, just uh, finished the draft Dutch report uh, in cooperation with UCL, Simon Marginson and had lots of conversations with him on our journey in Asia that I interrupted to be here. And our pro provisional conclusion is stupid. And I think it was well illustrated by Raoul's video yesterday. It's an absolute loss, loss situation. And I also think that Sheldon was right. It has never been a real love affair. The UK did not integrate well into the European model of internationalization based on mutual exchange and reciprocity. It had its own import model with far more students coming to the UK than British students going abroad. It called it an export industry like Australia and New Zealand with strong economic benefits on the short term as a rationale. Very few British students having a European experience. The decrease in the growth of international students is stronger than elsewhere, even before Brexit. The outcomes of the process could be very different. You can see here a hard, a soft, a semi-soft, um, Swiss Brexit, free trade Brexit. 
Moreover, the process is becoming more and more chaotic. That is rising the level of uncertainty, and that in itself is creating a lot of damage already. Brandon explained that yesterday. For higher education, the UK government thinks that it should replace the European multilateral model with a global bilateral model. Higher education would be central in the new trade agreements. In its view, it doesn't disengage with globalization, but it tries to return to the Commonwealth or the British Empire. The key question is for higher education, what should be the role of universities in this process beyond complaining over their own risks and losses? They did not see it come, and they probably don't see what they should be doing now, and may regret that later on, or may be criticized over that. Maybe it is not their best day in their history in terms of courage and leadership. When are universities leaders? in society and when are their followers, John asked yesterday. Peter Scott said, asked, are they on the wrong side of history? Sorry. To conclude on the European higher education area, here we can see some recent adjustments of the European Commission on higher education. Since the recent tragic events related to the radicalization in the parts of Europe, the European Commission focuses more on citizenship, enriched democratic life, intercultural competences, etc. It made it number two, social divisions, after employability, still the most important cause for disenchantment in the South. And it's a plea for more inclusive systems equity, including refugees. But as you may know, the EU has little to no legal competency in higher education and not a strong basis in terms of legitimacy. Education is an area of national policy under the subsidiarity principle. New nationalism in the Roosevelt sense is the last thing that European countries would expect or accept from the EU. A final word on the European research area, because here the EU's competencies are much stronger, legal competencies, and there is an 80 billion budget for R&D, which will grow. That will have a lot more impact on, higher on universities. What will also grow is Europe's defense capacity. Trump made it clear we cannot longer rely on the US while the situation with Russia is complex. Ministers signed this week the PESCO agreement for coordination of military capacity and a 5 billion euro budget for R&D, defense-related R&D was announced earlier this year. These trends may have more impact on universities than the higher education area. Thank you. Thank you.